go ahead. All right, this is disc number two of an interview with Norm Smith, done October 7th, 2010. In the first half of the interview, Norm told us about getting into the Army, how he became part of an airborne division. Now he's going to discuss with us his experiences in Europe, specifically um, coming upon a concentration camp. Okay. Well, I went aboard the Queen Elizabeth. This was the QE-1, not 2. There never was a QE-2, the Queen Elizabeth, that I wanted. This part of the Canard line, the Queen Mary was the twin ship. And uh, so I went up overseas on the Queen Elizabeth. And you were just 15,000 of us, is the best way I can say. You're going wherever they're going to use you as a replacement when you get over there. And landed at Glasgow, Scotland, you know, by train from directly to Southampton. And you know, we were just on the, getting on a ship to go across the channel. And they pulled 40 of us back because it had been a case of measles broke, broke out. So they were concerned about that. So we were 40 of us quarantined. All of the men that I was with went, as far as I know, went to the 17th Airborne. And very few of those guys came back from that. They made the last jump over the Rhine. And that was over the Rhine. It's commonly called a, a bridge too far if you read the novels. So the, I was held there right near Bastogne and an area called Alsace Lorraine for a few days and then I, the remnants what paratroops there were left, we were shipped to the 101st Airborne. And they had been surrounded at Bastogne. There were 26 men left in, in my company when I joined that company. All the rest were either killed or wounded. So I joined them and there was about the roughly the latter part of February of 45. First of April, we were called to for the final drive. We didn't know it was the final drive at the time, but we were dispersed along the Rhine River, and we went up to the front lines there. And uh, and the next thing we were moved, and we were moved southward, and uh, we. we no idea where we were going except we knew that the Germans were attempting to uh, their escapes in the south themselves. Italy had not capitulated yet, that is uh, northern Italy, so the Germans were trying to get in, into the, that area. We when we were moving it was just a matter of Heading down the right, just like driving down to St. Ed, basically. You don't know what's happening. You know that there's, you know, there's a battle going on. You can hear the explosions. You can see the smoke. And uh, what struck me was uh, at one point why we the stop and go traffic. And you didn't know what the devil was going on. One part of the highway was covered with smoke, just like a brush fire, and uh, it was a pungent type of odor in that. And the word came back that they said that the, on the left-hand side of the road there was a building that was filled with people, he said, and it had been set on fire, he said. So he said, there was, the people are burning in there. Well, that was the introduction to the Holocaust right there. And uh, we finally 
got past that when he got up to the edge of this area, and this was right near the town of Landsberg, Germany. Uh, the, the earliest troops in there, that is the armored unit that was ahead of us, had thrown the gates open, and uh, they were emaciated individuals wandering, but most of them were, were afraid to come out even though the gate was open. They just simply, we stared at them and they stared at us, and they couldn't believe they were free, and we couldn't believe what we were seeing, walking skeletons. So, uh, basically, uh, it's a story repeating itself over and over again. You had to watch where you walked, because uh, wherever these people congregated, they were they had diarrhea, they were defecating, no modesty, and to go you went right there. and. It pools like I've often described it as a comparable thing we have the way we keep cattle today. You, you go out and you don't use your best shoes to walk through the, a, a uh, concentration of cattle in order to with human beings. And uh, we went, we went uh, basically in the town, took over a building, billeted down for the night, and then we're came back the next day to make a thorough search of the area and uh, Germans were very meticulous and that area had been all reforested pine trees or coniferous trees and straight rows and you could measure from one row to the next no underbrush left and uh, we were told we were going to make a sweep through the road, through the woods, pick up any stray prisoners, and uh, soon it became evident that those people who were healthy enough, who had enough stamina left, to, said, I, I'm, I'm leaving, and they went as far as they could, and they just found a dignified place to die under a tree and died body after body after body. I mean, I'd get, take my rifle. I wouldn't touch, didn't want to touch him. They were just alive with vermin. Take my rifle, use it as a, a garment, I mean as a tool, and stick under the coat. I wanted to see if the person was alive, if every one of my father were dead. So body after body in the woods, and uh, it took us, in this particular sweep, took us about three hours to, to go just around the administration building and come back in. And uh, we were looking for anybody who could speak English. If we could find somebody who spoke English, at least we could converse with. We had a few of the fellows who were fluent in German. And we also found if they, you, you, using German as the basic language, you could also converse with the Russians. So anyway, we made the rounds. We came back. I recall one individual that uh, I noticed at the beginning that all of a sudden he's pushing his way through the crowd. He's got a little cap on. He's got a stick, he's got a pouch with something very precious in that pouch, and, and he's leaving. He's definitely going somewhere. And I had watched him go through to begin with. He went 40, 50 yards down the road, and then he sat down, and I didn't think anything more about it. So I come back after, I said about three hours, and I looked, and he said, it's funny, he's still sitting there. So I went back down there, and as I got within a few feet of him, I realized that he said he died when he sat down. That's mm -hmm. all I was to it. Stick was still over his shoulder. That was that was the end of his life. But uh, that kind of an impression uh, uh, is something you you do not believe. You just don't believe it. It stays with you, and uh, 
it wasn't until this last excursion to Washington, D.C. that I, I met a guy who he said, we were with you, and he was with an armored outfit. And I, I've been trying to converse with him since, but I haven't been able to get an answer from him. But he said, we were the armored unit ahead of you, so all I know was the 12th armored. But, uh, so that's any aspect of that experience is, is really the Holocaust. You use the people in that area, they were being used as, as slave labor. And the Germans did not handle the bodies. They didn't do any of the dirty work. They selected certain people who were called capos. If you want to stay alive, then you'll pitch them into a, the ovens and you, you'll, you'll, you'll do the dirty work. But uh, the Germans directed it, but they didn't get their fingers in it. And that's, I, I use the word Germans collectively, but a certain strata in their society, our society would function the same way. You have the power, prestige, and the work and within a community, you're the guy that gives the orders. Do you have any idea how many were in the camp when you arrived? I don't know how they would ever figure that out. Uh, there are other, uh, there's, there's estimates, everyone argues, well, my goodness, well, there's, is there six million? Oh, we're, no, 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 they'll argue about how many, no one knows. There's no way, the main thing is that it, it became, the slave labor became a, a problem because these people have to be fed. And when they die, you've got to do something with the body, and so they, they had, and the stories they heard, uh, I've since verified, I've done a lot of reading, or you used every bit of the human body, every bit. Bones are dried out. Take the bones out of the crummy crematorium, grind them up, put them back on the field and grow the crops. And uh, I have a, oh, a, a story of one guy, he did, did live over in Norfolk, but he, he said that my job was to clean out those ovens every day. And he said, and then I had to take, take it out and spread it on the vegetable garden. Uh, less, they worked them 12 hours a day, and uh, about a liter of, of soup made of some pie, some strange meat. You never knew what kind of meat would been thrown in there. Plus carrot peelings, potato peelings, and cook that into a, a type of soup. And that's what they were, one slice of bread. So, a lot of, a lot of testimony. The guys that I've, were American uh, prisoners fared somewhat better if the Germans allowed the Red Cross packages to get in. That was a highlight. That was one aspect of it. But, uh, I've never met anybody yet that had much to say, except it was a tremendously emotional experience. We were shipped around all over Europe in railroad cars. You go to the Holocaust Museum today and, and they brought one of those, a car back that had been used for that. When they built the museum, the 
situated the car and then they built the museum around the car. Otherwise, uh, it'd be quite a feat to get it up there. I don't know what to say. I've been asked many times. Stunned, bewildered, you can't believe it. And uh, once you've seen it, you don't forget it. And how systematic they were. And the more and more people they had to deal with, the more people, the different way they had to, to uh, work with them to figure out how to get rid of the evidence. And an Austrian banker who could speak English, he'd been in there for six years, eight years, and he demonstrated how thin he was by taking his hands and putting them together right at his crotch. And if you try this, even with, you realize that that gives you about this much space to go all the way around your leg and he had room to spare. Okay. And the stories there, once you hear the stories of these people, it's uh, very consistent. And if you were a, a displaced person, which the Germans used a lot of that, they went to Slovakia and uh, Romanian, like right now the Roma is in the news about what they're going to do. Well, anyway, gypsies, for example, uh, these people. These are the undesirable people, that's the way they were classified. They're imperfect there. You get rid of them. I was making a presentation at Fullerton one time, and uh, the teacher there had uh, invited a Polish priest named Father Fleshek. And when I was showing pictures of the crematorium at Dachau. Why well, he he interrupted me and, and he he said I carried bags of cement to build that building. And anyone uh, who had any leadership in the minorities uh, they wanted to get rid of or control. They're not going to let anybody in there that could be adverse to what they were doing. But. Uh, Got us actually train loads of bodies, and it's as I say, it's just the same thing over and over again. So, and you weren't in any way prepared for this. Oh God, no. We didn't. We had I total surprise. I don't recall. It. Anybody that, that said, uh, oh yeah, I remember they were talking about this. The Allies uh, agreed not to bomb Auschwitz and, and the bigger. Uh, they could have obliterated them as far as that was going. But, uh, no. So there's lots of controversy left now. Well, Norm, I want to thank you again. This is pretty intense to listen to, and I'm sure it's nothing compared to what it was to experience. Thank you so much, and maybe next time we visit we can talk about um, other parts of your experience. Mm -hmm.